I was just, uh, with a busy week, I was just trying uh, to come up with a, a message that I believe, um, I guess, has been on my heart. And uh, I've come up with a, a title called, Are You Committed? Committed to the job at hand the job that was given. A story is told of a teacher that was committed to her job. She was a kindergarten teacher in Northern America. And at wintertime, you know, they get plenty of snow. And so she was teaching her students and it was time for recess and a, a little boy taps her on the shoulder and says, teacher, can you please help me put on my shoes? Well, she said, oh, I'd love to. So he sat down, and he'd already put his boots in place, and she could see that they were on the wrong feet. But she said, I'm not going to embarrass him, and so she, they struggled to put these boots on, and no matter how hard she tried, they just would not go on. And she was frustrated. She was ready to give up, but she said, you know what? I'm committed to do this. And finally, he said, you know, teacher, I don't think they're going to go on. And she goes, well, let's try to put them on this way. And so they struggled to pull the boots off, and you know how that is. You finally pulled them off, and again, she got them on the right foot. Again, she tried to put them on, and they just wouldn't go on. And she goes, you know what? These boots, there's something must be in them or your feet must have grown since you've got to school. And he looks down, he goes, these are not my boots. But she was committed to follow through with what she was asked to do. So what does it mean to be committed? Would you describe yourself this morning as someone that is totally committed and in love with Jesus Christ? Or do when I, or when I say the words half-hearted, lukewarm, and partially committed, does that fit you better? For many of us, we've been a part of church most of our lives. And I've seen, especially over the last few months since my dad passed, I've seen so much fighting over wills. People that have, I felt, were committed uh, the greed that comes out, the, the hate. So where do you sit this morning? I believe that Jesus began his ministry with the most ultimate commitment that anyone could ever give. As you look through Scripture, it says that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, and then Jesus was filled with the Spirit, and then after baptism, He was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. When Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit, He was led. By the power of God, He was led into the wilderness. See, that's when you begin a total commitment to Jesus Christ. A pastor shares his journey of a 40-day fast. And so he journals every day that he's on this 40-day fast. And I want to share it with you this morning. Twelve hours in and I'm doing great. 
I started this morning like I do every morning of an extended fast, a bottle of water, a cup of grape juice, a multivitamin, and a vitamin C pill. For lunch, I'll have two bottles of water and one cup of grape grape juice. For dinner, I'll repeat the lunch menu, and I'll wake up and do the same thing for the next 39 days. And as I share his journey, I want you to think of the journey that Jesus committed to start his ministry. His commitment to give his all for you and for me. Day three, my body is out of food. My mind is out of energy. And it begins to set in that this is going to be a really long journey. I'll tell you, for me, if you talk with Terry, and Terry's in Brisbane, that's why she's not here. But if you talk to Terry about what happens to me, even if I miss a meal, <laughs> oh, I want to tell you, I think I'm on a 40 day fast. I get a little bit irritable, I get a little bit weak. But three days in, wow, on day six, your body goes into starvation mode. It figures that you are never going to feed it, so it might as well shut down. Exhaustion sets in. Day seven, my body has switched over to survival mode and has begun to feed on itself. But my mind is alert and clear. Day 11 becomes very tough. Your mind, body, and heart get weak, and you just break. Day 13, the tongue remains a constant shade of gray. Your breath is bad enough to kill a small animal. And your feet really stink. Every day past day 13, it seems like they might as well just wrap me up and put me in a coffin. I have no strength to go on. I want to quit, but I am committed to this journey. I'm committed to follow through, to try to understand what Jesus had to go through for me. Could you commit to something like this. Day 30, I have lost a lot of weight, enough to drop two shirt sizes. So if you're thinking that you want to go on on a diet, don't consider this one. But the tough one is day 39. I'm not sure I can finish. I don't even have enough energy to get out of bed. My mind is all over the place. I even have convinced myself on day 39 that this is not worth it. I want to throw in the towel. I want to eat. All I can think about is food. But I don't even have enough strength to look for it. And then day 40. It is finished. I have lost so much weight but I can even feel the organs in my Bible, in my body, struggling. 
to keep running. It's interesting that doctors say that after 40 days, your major organs start to shut down. And for those that decide to go on a 40-day fast, you can lose up to half of your body weight in 40 days. So I want you to think of Jesus' commitment to the job that, that he was given to come and save us. Jesus, after 40 days, no doubt was so weak But he was committed. Scripture reads, Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. How difficult that would be for me to spend 40 days thinking, Okay, now I can eat. Now I can get back to normal. But not Jesus. It was after the 40 days that the tempter came to him and then he says these words, if you are the Son of God. But Jesus answered and said, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him, took him up, it's interesting that sometimes we read through these verses thinking we understand. But see, Jesus was so weak that the devil took him. And the devil set him on the pinnacle of a temple. Jesus had lost complete control because he was not physical. He, he did not have the strength. He was not physically able to even carry himself, and the devil took him. And he says, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. But Jesus said to him, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all of these things I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. Then the devil left him. And behold, the angels came and ministered to him. Can you picture this this morning? Jesus, going through 40 days without food and then, and then being tempted by the devil. The Bible says to us, test ourselves. And so this morning, with the time that we have left, I'm going to offer you a description of what half-hearted, distracted, partially committed, lukewarm people could look like. A self-examination of where you stand at this moment is what's important. What needs to change for me, for you to be totally committed to God? See, uncommitted people attend church fairly regularly. It is what is expected of them, what they believe good Christians do, so they go. But the Lord said, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up of only rules taught by men. Isaiah 29, 13. Uncommitted, give money to charity and to the church as long as it doesn't impinge on their standard of living. 
If they have a little extra and it is easy and safe to give, they do so. After all, God loves a cheerful giver, right? Uncommitted tend to choose what is popular over what is right when they are in conflict. They desire to fit both at church and outside of church. They care more about what people think of their action, like the church attendance and giving, than what God thinks of their hearts and lives. For he writes, I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Uncommitted don't really want to be saved from their sin. They want only to be saved from the penalty of their sin. They don't genu genuinely hate sin and aren't truly sorry for it. They mer they're merely sorry because God is going to punish them. Lukewarm people don't really believe that this new life Jesus offers is better than the old sinful one. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Uncommitted are moved by stories about people who do radical things for Christ, yet they do not act. They assume such action is for extreme Christians, not average ones. For in James 1, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone then who knows the good, knows the good he ought to do and doesn't do it, sins. Uncommitted rarely share their faith with their neighbors, co-workers, or friends. They do not want to be rejected, nor do they want to make people uncomfortable by talking about private issues like re religion. But Jesus says, whoever acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before, before my Father in heaven. What does it mean to be committed? What does it mean for me to be committed? I've shared a story that happened when we were in Bundaberg, and I want to share it again this morning. Is that Terry was working with the combined churches during the, during the flood, but after the flood, there was still work to be done. And over all the churches that came together to help during the flood, there were hundreds and hundreds of believers. I would say in the thousands plus. Oh, they were committed. Oh, they brought their clothes. They brought furniture. It was, it was interesting that at our church, even though we were a distribution center, we even had to bring in containers to try to store all the stuff that was brought. But you know what? There, there was not one thing that was new. Everything that was brought was pretty much leftovers. I opened up one bag that people gave, and in the bag that they gave, there was a, a coffee can with coffee. And when I opened it up, there was only that much left at the bottom. There were clothes that were ripped, stained. Oh yeah, people were willing to give. They were committed to give, but they did not want to give their best. They only wanted to give the things that they were going to discard anyways, or the things they never used any longer. So Terry received a call about this 75-year-old lady that had lost her husband a few years before, that she was going to be evicted from her house because she was a hoarder. But if she was going to be evicted, she would be out on the street. And so Terry, 
sent out the message, had it announced in all the churches that we need help to help this lady. Do you know how many people responded after thousands of people were contacted about about helping? I'm talking about all churches, not just the Adventist church. But four people responded. Four people out of thousands that say they are committed to being the hands and feet of Jesus. Four people made that commitment. Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are very few who will find it. So where are we this morning? Where are you? this morning? Are you totally committed to the job that needs to be done for Jesus to come? If you're not committed, if I'm not committed, what will it take to say, that's it. I'm committed. I give it all. I took chapel at at Henderson this, this week on Monday. It was interesting. I did both primary and secondary. And so I asked the question, how many of you in secondary have an iPhone or a phone, mobile phone, and an iPad? Almost everybody put their hand up. And I said, but how many of you would like a new one and everybody put their hand up? But it was interesting in primary. I asked, how many of you have an iPhone or an iPad? And almost everyone put their hand up. But none of them were happy with what they had. They wanted something better. What does it mean to be committed? Are we content where we are? Are we happy? Do we feel that we are truly committed to the work that God has asked us to do? I know as a Seventh-day Adventist church and as Adventist people, I believe we have the message. I believe we have the truth. But are we committed to living out that truth in our lives? To actually show people this amazing love of Jesus and the kind of people that we must be. For love that God had for us never gave up. It never lost faith. It was always hopeful. And Jesus, in his commitment, even though he was weak and hungry, he endured through every circumstance for you and for me. Father God, thank you for being our God. Thank you for loving us so much and giving so much and going through so much so we could one day live eternally with you, 
Lord, I pray that you bless each one that is here. I pray, Lord, that as we examine each of our lives, I pray that we will surrender, we will give it all over to you. I thank you, Lord, for uh, this Sabbath day, and I pray that as we go through this day, I pray that your Holy Spirit will lead and guide each one into a saving relationship with you, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.